Institute of Berkeley and the AA in London. Uh, he's currently working on three editions, uh, one at least in Echo Park, and uh, is currently teaching at Woodbury, has taught at Syrac, I believe, the last seven years. Um, Gary Page, uh, one more left, is a Syrac graduate. I think the two of us are my Syrac kids. Um, now heads the Visual Studies Department here at the school, has taught at Syrac probably since getting out, and uh, practices and practices in Los Angeles. Uh, to my right, um, actually to uh, my far right, is Marianne Ray, uh, the new chair of environmental arts at Otis, uh, and a partner with, Mar with Robert Magarian and Studio Works. Uh, she's taught in the graduate program here for quite a, for a number of years, and uh, and at Rice as well. Uh, Studio Works is currently at work on a Montessori school in Milwaukee, uh, as well as well as a number of projects with the City Hall in West Hollywood. Um, Michele Say, to my right, is uh, um, actually worked in Italy and at uh, Morphosis before opening his own firm in 1985 in the city. Uh, Michele also teaches at SIAR, and a, a soon to be released Rizzoli monograph will highlight his many projects around the city. Um, this year, Michele received an Emerging Voices Award from the Architecture League in Los Angeles. Uh, I, we will start with a number of uh, very brief slide presentations to sort of orient, uh, orient. I think when when we first started trying to plan this discussion, one of the things that immediately came up with this with this group was um, that quite a few people felt as or more comfortable responding to Mata Clark's work with some of their own uh, as they did discussing it. And uh, we'll show a, a series of brief brief presentations followed by 20, 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, Follow. We'll begin with Mary and Ray, then Gary and Richard. Or I think I'm up and then Richard. Mary Ann, is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, can you all hear me? Um, These actually record us, but they don't okay. project us. <laughs> okay. These microphones will record us, but there's okay. no, there is no another sound system. Okay, um, so for the sake of uh, more discussion time, I've actually, um, I'm actually going to forego a preface that I wrote um, that had to do with the dangers and the joys and maybe the importance also of this thing we've been asked to do today, which is to forge a relationship between our, some of our own work and, at least in my case, I'd say, other work, which I think is far more, more brilliant than I uh, can imagine my work ever uh, being. Um, but um, in any case, we could leave some of that for the discussion later if it, it is of interest. Instead, I'll start right in. Um, this particular relationship with Gordon Mata Clark began in the very late 70s or early 80s in art school in Seattle, uh, BFA in painting there, and seeing all this Baroque, and after leaving the room, never being able to think of art or space or of making art or of making space in quite the same way ever again. The most obvious project of studio works um, that comes to mind, perhaps in respect to Meta Clark, is the Raise Up House. Um, here you see the house cut off its foundations and hoisted up to hover in the air, making way for a newfound space below. But in the final work, um, as I looked at this again and thought about it, I think that the relationship really breaks down and is, in fact, finally a kind of superficial one. This set me on a more serious search to try to understand some of the deeper relationships that I felt or thought um, were there, having been influenced so much by seeing his work uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Some of these deeper influences I could acknowledge and name as the roving eye and body, recycled surfaces, light occupations, and finally getting the job done. The first of these, the roving eye and body in space, the realization here was that I did not have to be a seated or standing stationary artist confronting either an easel or a drafting board. I could move around the world, I could move around space with tools of various sorts in my hand, and that space, um, and then enact space in various ways, at the same time be making things. This is one of our crews at, um, in the work at Adrian's Villa over the last 15 years. And in the work that uh, Robert and I and others have been involved with at Hadrian's Villa, it's sometimes difficult for us to describe 
how for us it is more than a simple documentary act of archaeology. Maybe partly from Gordon Matta Clark, we have a belief that a thing can be remade by touching it again, by looking at it again in another way, and that a new future is opened for a left behind um, piece of architecture through literally occupying it with the activity of new work. The next, uh, recycled surfaces. Um, in this work, um, and I think this work actually wouldn't have existed without having seen and known the alchemical works of Meta Clark. In this project for a facade for the Museum of Jurassic Technology, some reef sheathings um, were proposed and drawn, 40 in total. This was a device for viewing those against the original facade. These were often made from other decaying things transported to the site and transformed or remade. High tech on the left was made of discarded technological skins, um, carbon fiber, titanium, B-52 parts, which were flattened and stitched together to be like a hide of a missing or mythical beast. On the right, um, a kind of built strata of discarded everyday junk, plastic bottles, foam cups, old shoes, and curtains, um, smashed, then stacked, then sliced very thin, raised above the earth to act as the thing between the inside and the outside uh, to wrap the building. And this is one of the B-52 skins you might see out in, in Arizona in the desert. The next um, thing, light occupations. The ability to occupy space in an extremely light way and uh, for me, the hanging net habitations of um, Metacarp are so much about a very physical enactment or version of the light occupation. This is a small, carryable, or wearable, nomadic piece of architecture, a cabinet vest to be taken anywhere. Another light occupation, and actually I hadn't known about the um, thin strips of land that, that he had um, purchased and uh, was I thought those were just incredibly beautiful when Jane showed them to us yesterday. Um, another light occupation, a thin strip of unownable land, um, then with a, a thin tilt-up walls that jump up over a curb and sidewalk, um, barely touching down on the land. But then within those two walls, a street house with many houses perched up and inside of it. If you stop and really look at it, there's such a glut and clutter and weight of built stuff in the world already. It sometimes makes me wonder why I'm so heavily involved in promoting more and more of it, um, both through doing it myself and also through educating people um, to continue to make more stuff. It causes me to feel the beauty of the economical work, which is more about careful editing and re-seeing. An overwhelming response to this glut and clutter of stuff in the world is actually seen in the huge number of SciArc thesis projects. This is something I didn't have slides of, but wanted to bring into the form of the discussion. So many SciArc thesis projects that choose to work within existing buildings, which I absolutely think is uh, a debt that we owe um, to Mattaclock in many ways, rather than to work um, by building new buildings from scratch. Um, this is really a trend of maybe about the last seven years or, or so, uh, is very strong at SciArc. I think that this trend has come about a little bit to meet a desire within the thesis authors to have a rich context to work within, to have something to respond to, or to have their work be in dialogue with. In some ways, this might be, in fact, um, well, this, con that, um, this context of the found structure is, in a way, a substitute or a replacement for the lack of the context of other work going on in the world. Um, so this act of making the relationship between our work and someone else's. Um, that in a way, this act of working with the building is a kind of replacement or another version of this. Um, this context of influence and reference. And then finally being as fast as we can here. Um, getting the job done. This is hay, um, some hay for our pigs over in Italy on the top of the Otocinto Cinquanta uh, car that we use to run the errands around. Um, town. Maybe the most influential thing, um, and this is something drawn more from the way that Matta Clark worked than maybe even the work itself, the actual work itself. Um, Jane Crawford yesterday portrayed a great story. I think it, it made me smile more than any others in what you talked about. Yesterday it was, um, I don't know how many of you heard it, um, the fact that um, on the pier piece 
um, Mata Clark needed to go out and photograph it, and how was he going to find a boat in New York City inexpensively? So um, in the truck to Central Park, one of the lake boats is rented, um, taken out to photograph the piece, then thrown back in the truck and driven back and returned for closing time to the park. Um, his fearless ability to get the job done, to move forward without hesitation, and with great joy, passion, and optimism, as um, Jane also said yesterday, toward a project that one is committed to is something that Gordon Mehta had in such a great way. It rewrites the story of great art emerging best out of the deeply tormented and tortured artist. It, it's this lesson of both art and life being rarefied and straightforward at the same time um, that makes doing work uh, for us such a great thing. Speak a little higher, get the lights a little lower. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> lower the lights? Yeah. Okay, uh, in the interest of keeping this brief, because I brought uh, quite a few images on. I'm going to do maybe the opposite, just read the preface here, which is a couple of pages, and then uh, rifle through a, uh, a number of images. Okay. Uh, for myself, Gordon Mata Clark, along with Michael Heiser, Robert Smithson, and a few others, provided a way to reconsider, and ultimately reconsider, a way to reconsider and ultimately be critical of one of the dominant ideolo ideological tendencies operating in architecture in the late 70s, early 80s, um, when I was going to school. And that is the ideology of collage aesthetics. Whether it was the both-and eclecticism of Venturi, the historical illusions and layerings of graves, the micromegas of Leviskin, or even some of the dead tech tectonics of morphosis, architecture was, to a large degree, a discourse dominated by the machinations of collage and additive form. The work in ideas of Gordon Matta Clark and these other artists, which I mentioned, offered another context and trajectory to base an inquiry upon. As a young architect working in the 80s, trying to sort through influences, identify frames of reference and philosophical underpinnings, I found the work and the ideas to be provocative, critical, and revelatory. What did I learn from them? Well, three or four things for, for certain. Uh, one, time, duration, lived time, that is. And change is a condition of our existence. Life itself is impermanence and flux. And as such, it is important, perhaps more important than uh, space. Henri Bergson, what is, the, what is real is the continual change of form. Form is only a snapshot view of a transition. First two images, um, the Edgerton stroboscopic photograph, time exists as fractions of seconds. Here, the earthquake uh, in Chile, it's time is as um, an instant. Time duration that is embodies space and wrenches it loose from the abstractions of geometry. How as architects do we envision time? How do we draw it? How do we build it? Robert Smithson on, on, on the right here at the, the partially buried woodshed at Kent State, and then uh, a sequence of photographs by Tadao Ando of moving light in his studio in, in Osaka. Two, become an observer of processes rather than things. 
specifically to examine the seam or interstices where natural systems and cultural forms converge and collide. Weeds coming through cracks in the pavement. Uh, this image on the left, once again, Robert Smithson, set of photographs um, he took, uh, or stills from a film, the Hotel Palenque in, in uh, Mexico. And then a page from one of my uh, favorite books, curious little book on uh, the natural history of vacant lots, in which a uh, biologist uh, identified all the, the um, botanical growth in, in vacant lots in, in urban contexts. To work backwards, number three, to work backwards or in reverse. By this I mean simply to begin with something and move toward nothing, no thing, no thingness. I realize that this is a futile endeavor, a perpetual state of becoming that one never arrives at. I equate it with the poet who aspires to silence in each poem that he, she writes, but is condemned to continue using words and speech. In architectural terms, a manifestation of this idea is the dematerialization of form in order to reveal and foreground space. A drawing, one of these laminated paper drawings that, that have certainly been influential here at, 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 at SciArc in, in, in several projects or a couple of projects that, that we've run in the first year graduate program. I think I have a couple examples uh, following and then, of course, the, the Sapinski card, but this, this curious geometrical figure uh, where mass begins to give way to, to, to surface and volume, a kind of uh, diagram, diagram of an entropic system. Okay. Two of the, um, the drawings that I was referring to, Jennifer Dublay and Paul Holmquist. In architectural terms, a manifestation of this idea is the dematerialization of form in order to reveal and foreground space. It's also um, the, the attempt to approach the zero degree of architecture, a pursuit of the elemental. Uh, two images of this, to Dao Ando's uh, early work, Sumiyoshi House, again in Osaka, and Adolf Lowe's sketch for his own tomb, simple cubic uh, volume or mass of concrete. Um, and finally, into tempora temporalized space in order to concretize ph phenomena, both natural and artificial. It's a shifting in our frame of reference that in turn alters the conditions of awareness and perception, uh, away from the thing towards the, 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 the process or the effects of, of, of change. Bergson again, the permanence of a sensible quality consists in this repetition of movements. As the persistence of life consists in a series of palpitations, the primary function of perception is precisely to grasp, grasp a series of elementary changes under the form of a quality or of a simple state by a work of condensation. And finally, number four, displacement and void space. Once again, um, Smithson, on the slide on the left, his site and on site project, where he's recon uh, recontextualized work from one landscape and condition uh, and put it in another one, in this case, the metal bin in the gallery, and then the, the mere displacements here on the right. Rather than always trying to fill things up, saturating the field with more and more things, removing something, remove something, then remove something else, then remove something else. This is one of the things that, that, that I've learned um, in the work of, of, of these people. By removing, displacing, recontextualizing something, you disclose and reveal something else, something often hidden or unseen. Heiser's double negative is a good example of this. It affirms, it affirms through negation. This is as true for cultures as it is for abandoned buildings. A note in my sketchbook, 
reads, find ways to appreciate emptiness, look for the void in things, qualify emptiness through experience. What are the forms of emptiness? Finally, a couple of, uh, well, one void, an early work, I think, in 1970 by uh, uh, Michael Heiser, and then um, this series of diagrams on hollows, voids, cavities, and holes in the book of topology. I'm going to show and run very quickly. Uh, as I said, I've, I've, I, there's a bunch of slides. I'll say a few things and then just run through them machine gun style. Uh, most of our projects begin with a series of uh, diagrams and, and spatial constructions. This uh, work on the left is a simple cubic volume with a series of uh, volumes that are displaced and, and, and dislocated. It's a kind of reworking of this diagram by, by Van Doesburg that acquired material form here. Uh, material in the sense of a translucent and transparent skin then a series of, of solids inside. And this is a work that resulted uh, from, from those series of, of constructions and diagrams. Uh, and it's sort of named it provisionally the Slat House. And it was an attempt to, to find a, a fairly prosaic system of construction to, um, that would allow us to study the ideas of transparency and translucency that we saw in the, the earlier models. Volumes in the inside are then just displaced, and dislocated from the the initial body, and uh, redeployed in the in the landscape. Okay. The second project I'll show is called um, the X Y Z House, and it's it's part of a group of works that that we started about oh, three four years ago. Um, the grammar of which is, is all very similar. The syntax is, is, is what's different. You'll find a series of recurring elements that um, are just rearranged in different ways to, to affect different relationships. Um, all of them start with simple cubic rectilinear volumes. And um, this idea about two, two forms of geometry, one which is Cartesian, you see an example here of the joint from, from Riedfeld, overlapping legs. And um, then an idea deriving from, from topology uh, about the dematerialization of, of mass to create volume and surface. In this particular uh, dwelling was a, a detached addition in, uh, for Echo Park for a, uh, a couple. The, the husband is a painter and the wife is a uh, writer journalist. It's a simple cubic volume that has a series of um, penetrations in it in the foreground, lap pool. Um, fireplace that cuts through and is set adjacent to the lamp pool and then the, the third axis, the z-axis, is established by the, uh, the volume. And I'm just going to run through a series of <coughs>
Okay, and this last project uh, is a reworking of some of those ideas too. Spatially, I guess the initial diagrams and constructions are, are, are a little more complex and we became a little more involved with, with the study of topology and, and eversion, things turning inside out and outside in. Uh, but still, the, the project is a kind of Swiss, Swiss cheese of, of, of holes and voids. The site is in Topanga. Again, the client is a painter. The same uh, elements are, are redeployed. By that, I mean the lamp pool the main body of the house and then these, this fireplace. A couple new elements, a ramp system that divides or cuts in half the main body and a series of voids which, which penetrate uh, both in the z-axis and, and the x-axis. I forgot two, two introductions. The first was uh, Jane Crawford, who's been in town uh, for the last couple of days and is actually is Gordon's uh, widow and archivist and is uh, actually with her husband restored all of these films. Um, and without Jane, uh, this series would have happened in a whole lot of different ways. It was really her encouragement when I met her. And uh, well, the second introduction was my own. I'm Joe Day and uh, my, my bio was my bio read, lucky to be here. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I finished up at SciArc about three years ago. I uh, did my thesis work um, uh, on Gordon Mata Clark's work, which I think you can make out here on the, low, on the lower left, and Roberto Mata, Roberto Mata's work, Gordon's, Gordon's father. I was very interested in the way uh, the images that, that they had produced, as opposed to some of their, some of their, work, some of their other work, uh, began to uh, began to operate in a way that I saw um, Piranesi's Carcheriac chains operating, uh, creating spatial fields that were once um, recessional and and sort of pulsing forward that that created complex a complex sense of depth and at the same time uh, at the same time sat almost uh, sat almost dancing at the surface of the, of the picture. These are a series. Of analytical drawings I did of those of those three images. On the left is a is I, I did a series of three drawings. These are both the first series, which are studies of the bracketing and the perspectival structure of the of those of those images. Uh, on the left, Piranesi's is a three-point perspective that starts to hover around and bounce between vanishing points. On the left, Gordon's uh, the, the extrusion the Points you see pulled out have to do with uh, where the um, where the lens where the lens was collapsing the shape the shapes of those rooms before they were then re re, re together after the pattern of those cuts. This was the second series of drawings I did. These actually were uh, headed sort of in the opposite direction, um, sort of trying to accept the three images I was looking at as uh, as essentially flat as 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 a complex exercise in pattern making um, that involved a whole series of a whole series of, of coatings and um, and layerings um, and fissures that began to establish the spatial parameters of the images later. Uh, on the left is the third of those drawings of Roberto Mata's painting. Uh, so on the first image, on the right is. 
uh, is the third series, which was which was a, a series of studies I did to try to establish the spatial ambiguities of the, of the different pieces. In the Piranesi etching I was looking at, there's um, what could be called an Escher triangle, where a column in one plane actually sits, sits at the same time, at the same time in another. And in each of the three, between uh, the effect of collaging in Mata Clark's work, or uh, the kind, or a complex play of radial perspective and modest work, the perspective fields are multiplied. Those are the final, final studies uh, where I began to relocate uh, points of view within Mata Clark's piece. This is, a, this is an image uh, of this final project, um, Circus of Caribbean Orange, um, that was in three frames we, uh, with Emily Jagoda we sort of recreated the perspectives of those. And it turned out that actually these weren't, as are many of the collages we do at SciArc, uh, a, um, uh, a series of images taken from a fixed point. He had actually collaged together views from very different points in the cutting through very, very difficult points in the, in the cutting to actually get, get clear views. On the right is uh, the same series, uh, his, father's, his father's painting. <coughs> these are the last. These are overlays of uh, from here. I, from here, I went on to a, to a number of spatial extrapolations of those studies that later became uh, the, that later became the basis for a design for a museum for the family's work. Leave that. These are the next. Thank you, Jill, and Julie Silliman for inviting me to speak. Can you hear me in the back? By your luck, we're all here, I think. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to show you four projects which look nothing like Gordon Matta Clark's work and presume to talk about some aspects of his work and his films. Uh, he was a famous cook, and uh, yesterday Jane Crawford, his widow, told us that uh, he'd prepare a uh, great meal at every opening in order to uh, seduce casual passers-by. And uh, she said, he used to go over to his house for dinner and there'd be things, there'd be uh, bubbling pots all over the place, and uh, you were never really sure what was dinner and what was art. Um, and after dinner, everyone danced. I guess he was a great dancer, uh, like Coy. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, Famously so. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Duchamp was into alchemy, and Smithson was into alchemy, and Matta Clark was into alchemy. In alchemy, unlike chemistry, the shape of the vessel is as useful or effective as the ingredients within. Jane Crawford told me yesterday that Gordon believed people would come to his art and be transformed. The shape of the space that he cut from buildings is the thing that interests me. Um, the shape becomes a container of new possibilities. In Conical Intersect, the film, <coughs> there's a scene where they are, they're cutting through the plaster and the stone of the old buildings in Beauvoir, and uh, they're looking like uh, the Three Stooges playing a doctor in there to this building a bit, I think. And um, the space completely fills with dust in a kind of violent, deadly, reactive soup within <coughs> this space. Then at the end of the film, one of them stands Da Vinci-like in a circular cutout, as though born from the shape like the alchemist Mercury. Second, secondly, um, in 1971, Matta Clark and Jeffrey Liu each did a project at the Museo della Bella Arte in Santiago, Chile. And Jeffrey Liu says, in the basement, bathroom, Gordon busted apart a urinal 
and made a lens system all the way to the roof, reflecting the sky's images of birds and clouds on a screen or mirror right in the basement urinal. Matt Clark made a line or axis from the sky above to the earth below, connecting architecture, which exists in a kind of middle zone, to both. In Day's End, when he removes the pier's flooring, it's a dramatic revealing of a watery zone or region below, it seems to me. As in open house, when, the, when it's raining outside and there's that tarpaulin, that transparent tarpaulin over the top, and they sort of test that boundary between the realm above and the realm below. Metaclock says, what we all understand as building, or what is seen as the urban landscape, is just this sort of middle zone, tying the uppermost regions of the building with the lowermost, to establish a new master plan, which exists somewhere but has not been used yet, which does incorporate the underground and the sky and the building. The religious scholar Mircea Eliade says, there are three great cosmic regions which can be successfully transversed because they are linked together by a central axis. This axis, of course, passes through an opening, a hole. It is through this hole that the gods descend to earth and the dead to the subterranean regions. It is through the same hole that the soul of the shaman in ecstasy can fly up or down in the course of his celestial or infernal journeys. This, by the way, is a house for a writer and filmmaker, and that was his program. A version of it's being built in Echo Park. <coughs> Matt Clark said, finally, there's a kind of central nervous spasm that takes place when you really get into it, which just amounts to a sort of all-consuming gag all-consuming quake of some sort, which you really don't understand. Thank you very much. Can we have lights, please? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> wow. Maybe not quite so much light. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, I, am I the only one here at this table that actually met Gordon Monaco? I think so. I okay. think so. Okay. So see, I have a rare privilege. Uh, I'm sort of struck by uh, the mode of presentation that most of you chose. And I would just sort of ask a question relative to my uh, discomfort with it. My discomfort with it is that it's decidedly analytical. And um, the question that I would love to put my anxiety at ease around, if you could answer it, is to, um, first it has to do with, where does it get its power? Why are you interested? Why have other people been interested? Why have architects for the last 20 years, I suppose, been extremely interested and fascinated in the work of Gordon Monty Clark? I, for myself, my discomfort centers around the idea that the analysis which was offered doesn't help me gain insight into the source of the power. Where's the power, Gary? For myself, it's in, it, it is analytical, I think. Um, I've never, well, I guess I've seen some of the pieces that have been removed. I've seen uh, some of the photographs. But the power for me is really in, in the idea of the work, which I try to uh, say, at least at the moment, at, at the time that I was looking closely at it, uh, offered a way to to work in in reverse, to to develop, let's say, ideas uh, about form and space generation 
that, that acknowledge uh, different systems of, uh, or processes of time. Anybody else? Okay. Um, well, I, I just want to say one thing first. I, I didn't know Gordon Matter Clark until I came to the United States. And uh, when I first came to SIARC, and Betsky asked me, do you know who's Matt Gordon Matter Clark? And I said, no, I, I never heard of him. And um, the next question was, have you been to the movie Blade Runner? And I said, no, I don't know that movie even existed. And, and he said, well, what are you doing at SIARC then? There's no reason, I mean, you haven't seen Blade Runner and you don't know Gordon Matter Clark. Um, and, and it was very interesting when I first, actually, the first time that I opened one of his books and I look at the work, it was, uh, um, I, I think that the, the power of really transforming someone uh, could be sort of experienced in that moment for me. I, I look at the work and I felt fear and I felt power. I felt fear because I, I sort of like saw um, what architecture is not about. It's not about. It's not about. And, uh, and I felt power because um, somebody dared to actually put it in the world, in a real life, and uh, walk away from it. And, and the, the ability to transform something and not see it as a commodity and be able to walk away from it and see it destroyed was one of the most uh, powerful messages that I got from the, from the work. And the spirit behind it, it just revealed itself eventually, you know, um, I became more and more interested and read more and more about it. But, you know, I, I still, um, uh, the only time that I really visited that sensation was a few years ago, I did an homage to him in my studio. I just picked up a charcoal and I draw a slot of wall in, into the wall in my studio and I started cutting and I started demolishing and removing the, the, the parts and and uh, was another revelation that it's goddamn difficult. <laughs> it's not even uh, as difficult as one might imagine it is. It's removing those pieces was weeks and weeks and I was like in a 10 foot, 15 foot long by 8 inches uh, depth of space and uh, but um, but it was a remarkable experience. It was a remarkable experience. Does anyone else want to touch that question? Do you like to touch it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was uncomfortable with the idea of even having to kind of show slides of work alongside of the thing. And, what? Uh, the, half, the half two is an interesting thing. Did you have to? Who made no, you? no. But in thinking about it, <laughs> and this is what the preface sort of dealt, dealt with and uh, not kind of having the time to, to do the preface, but. In any case, there were two things that I was going to talk about, and one was having seen a uh, lecture by Anne Hamilton here some years ago. I don't know if some of you were there, and it was a fantastic, incredible lecture, um, very inspiring. The work was um, quite incredible. But one thing, in going away from it, that was a kind of nagging question, was that there were so many unacknowledged um, references to other art and other artists' work in that, that it, it, it was almost as if um, verging into starting to talk about that would have compromised the originality of, of the work. I, I'm not maybe getting to your analytical uh, the analytical question, but the other thing that I wanted to say was that um, having read and reread Calvino's Six Memos for the Next Millennium, if you, if you know the series of lectures that he was um, in the middle of giving at Harvard when he, he died, and the whole book is really about the unfolding of the many layers of references um, that his work had, how the craft of writing, of his own writing, um, was exposed and kind of uh, celebrated in the writing of that that piece, and so the, I wanted to try to get over that uncomfortable um, aspect of uh, certainly not wanting to ride on some kind of coattails that don't uh, have very powerful coattails that sure don't need you at all. But um, but in any case, the value of, kind of, of going back into one's own work and seeing where it came from, why it is the way it is, and how well, it's been. I, I raised the question because it seems to me that. Certainly, we're all architects. I assume that most people out there are architects. And I assume that most of you came in contact with the work uh, at least earlier than tonight. And that means in some sort of way that it was formative to you. So it seems to me that at a certain level, we're talking about a man's work and his, his sort of life project. 
and there's some kind of power there that's incredibly captivating. And it's not, I'm, 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 I'm myself uncomfortable that just to relate it to someone else's work somehow is in fact informative. So the question really is, what do we say to this group that in fact somehow they can carry away some insights relative to this? And see, then I'll, I'll preface that with my own little story about, or my part of my, I can only tell part of the story about uh, uh, of, uh, my meeting in the time I spent with Gordon Mott Clark. But uh, certainly I never had a sense that he was uh, half a person. I always had a sense that he was a very complete and very complex and uh, very interesting person in the sense which we normally use that word, an interesting person. Uh, <clears throat> And I think that it was the sort of completeness and fullness of that, which was as a person, you know, I enjoyed spending time with him. I didn't, I didn't share any of his work. I never visited his work. We basically dated women that knew each other and went out drinking together and things such as that. And uh, so it was a real, more of a social relationship. And over the periods of several months that I spent with him, when he was out here in California, um, he seemed to be, uh, you know, the complexity of him, is really what I find in the work. And it seems to me that while everyone has sort of parsed out little things uh, relative to their own work and relative to what's interesting to them, that is the absolute complexity and the sort of symbiotic synthesis of those things which really is, is the power of the work. It really doesn't have to do with any kind of singularities or partiality. It's the confluence of really many, many things that come together that's there. I would suggest that for architects, and certainly for me, and I didn't, really, I didn't really know him or know his work before I knew him socially, but certainly for me, I was fascinated by the fact that he was educated as an architect. I was fascinated by the fact that as a young architect myself, uh, here was someone who basically had, had the strength of character and the resources or will or whatever to essentially uh, start doing something in the world. Whereas I uh, had not been able to do that very successfully. So the que another question is, uh, it seems that we have uh, a kind of fascination in academia with those people that are out in the world doing things that somehow do it client free. I think it's a kind of client <laughs> envy. You know, so I'll go. You know, and uh, I think that, that that's, I mean, is any of that going on here? I mean, here's a guy who basically went out and did something. You know, and affected the world, and affected all of your minds, and all your emotions and passion. And uh, yeah, he did it. And uh, anything in truth to that, Richard? No, I disagree completely. Good. As far as my interest with him, I um, and my interest with architecture, I think architecture is and cannot be the product of one individual. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with the workers, dealing with the other people, so on and so forth, dealing with the client, and that's what makes a complex and rich work. And I think, in fact, to answer your first question, I think it's, the, it's simply the space that is, that, that is the most impressive about his work. And you see that in the films. And I think that is a result of his interaction not only with the building, but with the other workers and with all, the, all that went into actually making that piece. So I don't think it's an isolated endeavor. Uh, I don't, I well, chiming okay. in, in a little bit, just because in researching Lana Clark's work, you realize very quickly that what what's often presented as this sort of heroic, uh, you know, chain, uh, certainly no massacre, but a lot of chainsaws involved in the in the work, it turns out to be this incredible this this incredibly complex collaborative endeavor where a lot of the projects early on there were quite a few uh, days in which uh, days end which will screen. Uh, just after this is a piece where Gordon and a few friends went into a city structure and, and took some pretty serious uh, uh, took some pretty serious pieces out of it without approval. But in many cases, he went through through elaborate bureaucratic red tape to get the opportunity to do some of those pieces. I don't think on on that fundamental level his endeavor was all that removed from an architect's, except that uh, the client the client. The client ends up perceived in a much more abstract fashion. It, I think he's he's speaking to he's his work isn't uh, isn't about isn't about soothing uh, soothing 
particular client, but in many cases, his involvement with gallery, the gallery owners was, was, was very tightly, was very tightly involved with how, how he got to realize the work. Uh, splitting wouldn't have happened without Horace and Holly Solomon getting into that, that building. Um, I don't know, and it's sort of a dry, <laughs> dry, a dry end of the end of the spectrum to talk about, um, but I, I think it touches on something interesting that that is a part of this weekend and maybe part of the tension of this weekend, which is that um, there's clearly quite a bit of enthusiasm among among architects for an, for an artist who was educated as an architect and left the, and left the profession, uh, and who did that actually on the heels of a father who had done exactly the same thing. You see, a, you know, a family who, through the 20th century, knew, knew, understood the debates of architecture of their day as profoundly as they could, and rejected it. Stepped out, stepped out of that debate. Roberto Mata works for Corbusier, meets Salvador Dali, and writes a treatise against his former employee or employer. Uh, Gordon Mata Clark was educated at Cornell and, and goes on to goes on to goes on to shoot the windows out of the Urban Institute. I think one of the points that's really interesting for me about bringing the work, especially to SciArc and bringing it back, bringing it to Los Angeles, is the degree to which architecture here is perceived to be constantly in a state of, of, um, of undermining the, the, current, the current assumptions of the profession. And I think the degree to which Gordon Mata Clark becomes um, has become here and at other schools, uh, you know, almost too tidy and and redundant a citation in student work. In some ways, is a reflection of that of the role he played. Yeah, you've raised an interesting issue about the sort of myth of Sciart, uh, the nature of the place. Uh, do you actually see Sciart as being within this tradition of Gardner Clark's really aggressive sense of transgression? He was a great transgressor. He was out there. He was, uh, I don't, I, as I look around and I've been here for 20 years, I don't see that kind of transgression. I don't see that kind of, that kind of passion, that kind of commitment to ideas. I don't think an institution is going to embody his, 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 his ethic in life. I think there are certainly some, some characters at Sciar. I remember uh, I had a, a close friend living in a, living in a mock-up of a, of a, of a prison cell that had been, that, been built for a seminar we taught here. He moved into the mock-up, lived there for three months, and then torched it in the parking lot. Um, certainly, uh, you know, on, on the level of drama, he was he was keeping pace with Mata Clark. But that, that raises the issue, though, that, that there was a kind of street smart use of this transgression. That the kind of that the kind of uh, tutelage that he got directly or indirectly through his <clears throat> parent role modeling, etc. That there was a kind of path that was perhaps perceived consciously, perhaps unconsciously, that he knew how to, in fact, exploit, position himself relative to the ongoing cultural debate. So uh, this example you mentioned, I'm sure there's lots of others at Sire, but uh, we probably haven't been very good at teaching our students how to actually exploit those gestures and, and position themselves relative to these cultural I, I, I agree with you. I think part of why we were really interested in bringing the films to Los Angeles was to go through some demystification and some, clar some clarification about what Mata Clark was up to. I think a little bit what the films show, especially when you watch them end to end, as, as I've done a couple of times this week, is the kind of enthusiasm and, and, um, and uh, um, I mean, he was having an incredible, an incredibly good time making a lot, of, making a lot of these pieces. Even at the end of his, li even at the end of his life, when he was, when he was getting, when he knew he was very ill, he was doing some incredible, incredible, body wrenching work to get these pieces realized and enjoying himself. And I think on that level, to the degree that Sayark tries to tries to operate in that, to operate with that kind of enthusiasm, or not Sayark, anyone, anyone in the, anyone in the arts tries to. That I think there is a real affinity, but I think the degree to which formal, quota formal quotations, snippets, and bits and pieces, and especially as Pamela Lee, who's in our audience tonight, uh, <laughs> actually just completed her, th her doctoral thesis on Mata Clark, uh, spells out at length the image of splitting, where the house is just, just halved and which appears on our poster to boot, is one of the most over-circulated and, and easily seized upon images of, um, you know, for architects to sort of uh, 
immediately distance themselves well, that from. That raises a really interesting other issue because the the qualities which are, which were commented on, not necessarily exclusively, but the qualities which are commented on the presentations seem to really focus on the sort of indexical aspects of the work. That is, the work was basically uh, had to do with certain actions, and those actions were dealt with as an abstraction. But that house and the power of that image being split, that really is, in fact, symbolically laden. And I'm, I'm really, one of my points of dissatisfaction earlier is, is that the whole idea of symbol and symbol manipulation really wasn't dealt with in terms of some of the other comments that we made. And I'm curious as to what thoughts you might have about that since you haven't spoken of it previously. Well, one thing maybe backing up a little bit to the previous discussion and putting two of your questions there together is that within the form of this architecture school, uh, we spend a lot more time sitting around and analyzing things than we do actually go out and do things or even promote or support that in some way. I think you actually kind of challenge fundamentally the, the notion of architecture schools as we know them as uh, we're probably. Um, did. I mean, it is another model for an architecture school. If I really were radical, we would be um, supporting each one of you to find a path out there in the world where you actually were. Uh, it was sort of the thing at the end I was getting out with the fearless act of just getting out there and getting the job done, just uh, going after something with that absolute uh, passion, commitment, um, focus. I mean, people who are involved with thesis this semester here are stumbling through, you know, the kind of roadblocks, all the things that stop you from making things because you're being analytical, uh, because school and the kind of setup here is so much about that is, uh, I don't know, I wonder about that sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, especially when I look at the work mm -hmm. that we've seen in the films. Or and then about the question of the symbolization and the power of the symbol and how his acts were on objects which had highly recognizable Absolutely. images. Absolutely. Right. became the, the institute, right, right, the institute, the house. So that, 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 that poster image very, and the power of that poster image and the fact it's been reproduced many times, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a casual a, thing. It's not I mean, so just so you fair, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I, it came up a little bit yesterday in Jane in Jane's discussion. I think it's an interesting sequence that happens in the building cuttings. He goes from residential, from a number of residential houses into um, into some institutional work. There's also a really clear progression, uh, and this is all in that analytical tradition <laughs> that might not be what you're after, but I think actually the, oh, I, I think the analytical and the symbolic are really tightly bound up in the way he went about deciding the deciding the moves he made in these buildings, in the early houses. Wait, 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 wait. Can I, can I finish? Well, I'm, yeah, but I'm really curious as to what value, it, and obviously you play some value in it, so I'm, it's a question. What value is to be gained by trying to suppose how he went about analyzing these houses? As, as related to the things as artifacts in the world okay. and then the power. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in recreating his, his mindset going into it. I am, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that in the houses, you go through a very literal manifestation of architectural representation in these houses. He, he, cro he, he performs a cross-section on a house. He then goes on to lift an elevation off of a house to reveal to reveal a, to reveal a section. In those early projects, it's almost a, a didactic project. Clearly, it's important that these are houses, and quite a few people have written about how his work and domesticity and the degree to which his work um, his work has to be read in in sort of gendered terms is really important. But I'd, I'd just like to go through the progression. He moves from those into much more, into more complex geometries. Conical intersect, which we'll see later, is, is, a, is you know, an enormous project based to a certain degree on a pun. It's a conical section through, through, this, through this building and the kinds of geometries that erupt out of that are, are, are a revolution within, within his own work that build in projects like like, day, like Day's End and uh, Circus and um, well, Office Broken and in Circus in that order, what you see are a whole series of, of, of really um, clear and simple geometries that are winding their, winding their way through these built environments. And the selection of those, of those geometries and the, the choices he made, the symbolic, choice, the symbolic choices are paired with this paired with this really almost dry analytical decision making that he goes through. The circles do relate to, you know, the spheres in Caribbean orange are supposed to relate to three rings in a circus and how museums may or may not be circuses when you're doing a project. But to what, to what extent does, do we have to know that in order to 
experience the power of the work. Because I, and my sense is that I don't know any of that. And I still find the work powerful. Fair my, my enough. Fair enough. My, I would, my I, suggestion I'm not, is that I'm not there's, saying there's any there's a, there's a kind of language that we use. There's a language we, we use. Richard's prefaces, or biases space, as a kind of the thing which makes it most impressive. And you're talking about the decision-making process and the, the intricacy of that, the complexity of the thought that goes to that. But it seems to me that really it misses the it misses it misses the thing, the artifact, the thing itself, which really creates the effect. And the effect has to be as powerful as it is, as powerful as many people find it. I don't think it can be reduced to concepts because we're not moved by concepts. We're moved by the emotionality of that, which has to do with the kind of full-fledged presencing of that object, which has to do with the textures, the cutting sense of space, the quality of light, the, the actual act of both being analytical but at the same time being destructive. It's a very, very powerful simultaneity. It's not a singularity. And I think to, to parse this out in kind of partialities really in many ways uh, diminishes the work. And so my, I know you know this, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm only saying this because I don't want students out there to leave and think, oh my God, if I just take some circles and I just do this, my words could be bitching. Everybody in the world's gonna no, love it. I mean, the, yeah, but that, that doesn't work. It no, doesn't that work. absolutely is. It has to do with the richness of that found artifact and the and the actual symbolic quality okay. of that artifact and the reality of that juxtaposed okay. against the conceptual. That's we brought the films for that because okay. Koi, you've met Gordon, and I think to a certain degree, the degree to a certain degree, that kind of elemental understanding of his work for many of the people that did know him was a byproduct as much of knowing him as having anything to do with the work, as you said. There's, the vast majority of people in this room couldn't have, couldn't have met Gordon. And I think bringing the films here, at least, uh, I was really interested in seeing them because I really, I've always felt at a certain kind of generational remove, I won't know, I won't know the work that way, but through the films you can begin to piece together some of, you know, some of the energy and some of the, some of the focus I think some of the um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pin a word on what you're what you're going after, but I I think I'm going after anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me let me let me uh, switch gears if I could and ask another question. Uh, it's it's been suggested by the presentations that that there's been some source of inspiration or influence that's been felt uh, directly or indirectly, and it seems to me that there's a at minimum, there's a kind of continuum which we could sort of describe. And on the one hand, we could just say, I really like this work and I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to mimic it. I'm going to do this kind of stuff. Right? And then on the next, we might say that there's a, a kind of uh, looking at the work and we conceptualize some aspect of it and we generalize that to ourselves and then we use those strategies in the report, kind of secondary. And then third, there's a kind of deep understanding of it in some way. And there's some notion about what it might embody, and there's a kind of transform transformation that there's an extension in some ways of this. And then it seems that, like lastly, that there is in fact a, a, a possibility of understanding the work and contextually embodying the sort of general feeling of that work in a much deeper, richer way. There's a kind of fusion. And what do you think? I think I, I think that the work touches, I mean, photomatic large work touches um, each one of us at different levels or different layers. And we, 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 it's really difficult to really understand at what time of our, in, in the process of our work um, or, uh, or viewing the work of our uh, colleagues or friends, um, we can actually see that influ those influences or recognize those influences. And ultimately, does it matter at all if, if we can do that or not? Uh, that's, a, that's a thought that comes to my mind. And, and also, you know, uh, um, to a certain extent, we can't really know uh, exactly how that development that we're sort of identifying in the films or in the books at actually in what order these developments or transformations or um, growth that in his work is very visible from the first films to the towards the last 
uh, really took place? How they were actually, how did he really travel through this path? Um, the, the, there's some clips of, you know, process noticing like, you know, the, the, the dust of um, dust all over the room or, or the joy of dropping a wall into the site um, property or breaking a house and let it sort of split apart. All of those things are kind of like we can sort of relate it to our own little joys at certain moments in our lives. I mean, like I, I can sort of relate it to something that got me the same emotional, had the same emotional impact for me. But, but how important is that? I mean, going back to the question that you just put forward, mm -hmm. how important is that if, if for someone, uh, it's a spatial quality of the work which is um, inspiring and motivating and helps someone make it move or do something very interesting or someone analytically reaching that same conclusions or someone neither like you know like I had I mean like I have a very limited understanding of the word but it moves me I look at it it moves me I read about it, it it's very interesting to me and ultimately uh, I think it has had some influences in me no, but I understand I, that okay I'm not I'm not suggesting that I'm not trying to deny anyone's experience with the work. It's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suggesting is that it's, it's on the one hand, we can be sort of self-congratulatory about our understanding of the work and our relationship to the work. And we can be self-referential in terms of that. Mm -hmm. okay. And none of us are interested in doing that. I know that. But and on the other hand, we can be very critical. We can bring uh, a different kind of perspective to the work. And we can challenge the work through engaging it with different sort of thought processes, different, different historic situations, etc. Right? It seems to me that that ultimately one of the things which we can can be benefited is by deepening our understanding of where the power does come from. Right? And I don't think it is in singularities because the, the power is not that it affects you because of the dust or richer because of the space. The power is in fact because of the simultaneity and the density of the expression. And, 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 and the absolute refusal to deny that density of experience and not rely on a conceptual framework. He didn't do drawings. He may have done drawings, he did the cut. But he didn't do drawings as a primary mode of expression in the world. It's not how he chose to presence himself. He chose to presence himself in the world through the work in a very different way. But the work, work constantly from beginning to the end, it, there's a certain spirit of constant instigation or discovery just looking into things and unlayering these. Whatever he's looking into is like constantly, he's preoccupied to go deeper and deeper and understand more and more about what he's looking at. Yeah, and you know, again, that again, spirit is like constantly... No, that, know, of course that's true. But more again, you know, sometimes we might have a tendency to romanticize what that process is really like. I mean, certainly, as Joe suggested, there were a lot of people that were extremely supportive in Gordon Monaco. There, and there were people that brought him things. Here's a, here's, a, here's a building that I'm about to demolish in the case of the split house. I mean, Horace was about to tear that house down, right? And he said, here, you can have this. So, okay, I've got a weekend, and I've got to cut this baby. And <laughs> let me make one cut. That, so that house, it was not, the, the strategy for that was not intellectualized. It was like, I've only got yeah. so many hours to do this, the simplest possible cut that I can make. <laughs> But yet, at the same time, the economy of that gesture produced, in terms of the symbolic juxtaposition of the house, an incredibly powerful image to resonate, right? So the, the, those histories, I think sometimes when we, when we visit them, if we don't really flesh them out in terms of the reality of the circumstances, we tend to romanticize them in ways which we do ourselves a disservice. Because it doesn't help us in our own work. It doesn't help us position ourselves in our culture. Right? Well, there were a lot of people that were really very, very supportive. Uh, yeah, why don't we do that? Joe suggested that we open up and if there's any questions or comments that anyone in the audience would like to address, generally or specifically to any of us, we're <laughs> analytically or otherwise, <laughs> we're ready to uh, try to handle those. Any questions? 30 seconds. I have a question. Um, it's always been referred to him that, um, that he's gone to architecture school and there's the second son and on Thursday night also at UCLA, that he has this painter father and there's a huge um, history of painting that's very much in that sort of cubist, 
surreal and stuff and so it's making me fun. How much of this work has something to do with synthetic and analytical cubism and how does Kurt Schneider get involved with his own process of thinking what he's doing? Well, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I mean I'm not but an art historian. There's lots of people who could, say, who could talk about that. I think that at the same time it's it's interesting because it's another historical context sure. for it. Sure. Sure. Has never spoken right. about it. Well, there's, there's other historical context as well. Right. It's not that it, I'm not Excuse denying me. that it still has its occurrence, but somewhere along there, I think that to, in order to demystify, you know, what's happening here, <coughs> what's happening with Gordon Mark Clark overall in architecture, or whatever, that what what you know these other ideas I think are part of. It. Well, yeah, he was he was an incredibly smart, savvy guy. You know, I mean, he knew all that stuff. Yeah, he did. And uh, yeah. And, there was, there was, there was, and I don't know this for a fact, but it seemed to me that he was a person who was pretty angry, had a lot of internal demons, and uh, certainly architecture school was an uncomfortable place for him because of the over reliance on the analytical. It was, it was not comfortable for him at all. He was much more a person who liked to engage things in a passionate way. And certainly, in conversations to me, it was suggested that uh, cutting up of models was pretty, pretty bitchin' activity that he enjoyed a lot. You know, and so there's some stimulus there in a kind of mundane, trivial engagement. But you know, on a more heightened, deeper level, psychoanalytic, psychodevelopmental, you know, with regard to his family background, he knew all of that stuff, certainly. But at the same time, when he went to New York, there was an incredibly savvy young man going to New York who knew what was happening on the scene. And he positioned himself very strategically relative to the movement away from the gallery, relative to conceptualism, so that there was simultaneously a kind of engagement with that world, but at the same time positioning himself with the elders who are already in the leaders in the field. Relative. And I think that's where some of the power is, both the, you know, the action and the conceptualism. Of course, of course. So by isolating them, somehow trying to you know, get of course. to them. Yes. To answer your question about what is the power of it, I think when Hill's work is like it's everything about architecture except being the one basic thing that architecture needs to do, which is shelter. It's all about the spirit of the architecture, the making of things, and the materiality of it. And yet none of it is about sheltering you, and yet it works as objects of shelter, which gets back to the question of symbolism. Mm -hmm. So in, in my view, that's sort of what it's the immediacy of those acts. But, the, but, but that's, yeah, that's kind of, false stuff. The, yeah, because the, the breadth of the work, I mean, first of all, the space of other negative, and they might let the rain in those pieces are a kind of shelter for um, bodies in a kind of incredible way, but also some of the balloon um, light dwelling structures that um, are part of the work and the net structures. I mean, a lot of people know the work, you know, you know the imagery of those cuts, and that's the kind of end of the story, and there, there's a lot of other aspects. And, kinds of work that actually got made. So I think actually I mean, the way that he provoked us to um, engage shelter by splitting the house, you know, at the very core is Koi saying symbolically of America, of um, the American house, um, that I could never say that shelter was not a part of the... No, but and I it wasn't even anti-shelter. I, I guess I wouldn't simplify to that, to that level either. I, I really... Well, I don't necessarily know that's... I mean, I don't think that his work is about building think about the new architecture, except for the one basic aspect, which is I don't think he's talking about building architecture in the sense of the definition of a building. It's in the projects like going into the forest and seeing the four trees there. And that's but, the, but the work is also not architecture. Right. It, it does say, and I, I, I would suggest, I would be bold and suggest that part of the power for a lot of architects is that they clearly see it is not architecture. It is something else and everybody wants that something else in their work. Right. What is that something else? Well, does that, does that something else have to do with the clarity of utter uselessness in a way, or the futility of the gesture? I mean, exactly. in many ways, what has been, I was mentioned earlier briefly, but I mean, it's an incredible assistance and gesture to do uh, this type of work, and actually a lot of the films have really employed the structure as well, where you know, three quarters or seven eighths of the film is about this act of subtraction, this creative will of destruction. Uh, which is done and actually, it, it actually builds the power behind the work and then the remaining 
like 1 8 or 30 seconds or 45 seconds is about this other act of destruction which completely erases and eradicates uh, the physical being of the work that's represented, documented only in the film and photographs. Uh, and, and the fact that that, that that cycle is allowed to occur over and over again is in fact uh, willed by the artist to be able to do that. Uh, I mean, that, that, that kind of Sisyphean gesture of, of uh, creating by destroying, but then actually allowing that erasure to occur and actually encouraging it, uh, I think is, is a lot of where the power lies. Because uh, architects struggle with the kind of futility of, of creating, you know, beautiful monuments and things that last forever and solving problems and all of these things. And in a sense, uh, it was just a very simple. Very, uh, I mean, it's, I think it feels right. It's interesting how the how the bulldozer becomes protagonist in a couple of the films, in Bingo and in and in Fresh Kill, where where he demol where his truck is demolished. The, tr the there's there is that point where what we're reading as as a reductive and in some way destructive gesture is completely completely overwhelmed by the actual demolition of. Of the, of the of the structures, I think I, I'm actually still interested in your point because I think your definition of, of architecture, in for Gordon and perhaps in that time and context in general would have been far closer to uh, to a policy of what they'd call containerization, which would, which they were out to fight. The idea that shelter is the fr uh, is the first first and, pr and primary and primary rationale for architecture I don't think would have sat as sat as easily with him it would I think the idea I think most of his built most of his projects are actually very involved with uh, highlighting how buildings are both architecture and property how they're how they're both how how what he's operating in is a field both of, of space and re and real estate and to the degree that many of his many of the first gestures he makes, as you see in the films, is to open up these kind of ocular openings into the space, whether it's and whether it's a clean whatever the formal preoccupations of the project are. Almost in, in almost every project, the first move is to simply open up open up a field to work in. I think as much as it is the object of architecture to shelter people, it's also to allow them you know, habitable spaces with light and with, you know, with, with a broader, with a, a far broader understanding of spatial quality. And I think that is some of where, you know, some of where the enthusiasm that's for the... That's the core thing about the object being the ultimate sort of giver of that emotion as opposed to sort of the concepts or something that for now is just... See, I don't, think the, I don't think the object gives those emotions at all. I don't think that's true. I think that we read in the objects and what I've been trying to sort of elicit is that in fact it's the multiple values that the work in fact mirrors that in fact is what gives it its power. That it is in fact multidimensional in its configurative power. It continually can reconfigure itself depending on the values that we hold. But at the same time, it in fact operates in many modes of perceptual receptivity. It's multimodal. It's sensory motor, it's kinetic, it's cognitive, it's in fact all of those things. And those are the things which normally architecture doesn't do really well. It doesn't have that configurative nature. Primarily why? Because it's analytical, it's reductive. It doesn't bring to it that kind of orientation towards the inclusive. It in fact tries to be in its power through an exclusive framing of reference rather than an inclusive. Um, Please. Yes, I, I usually uh, like to leave these discussions to you all. There's just one issue we sort of <laughs> brushed up against that I know Gordon would have been very vocal about. Um, it was a criticism constantly leveled at him while he was alive, uh, that he was destroying houses or destroying property. And he never, ever saw anything that he did as being destructive. It was the alchemist who uh, came out again to transform something from one thing into an another. But whatever it was that he was cutting or removing or, or changing, never in his mind did he ever think that he was destroying or harming anything in any way. Uh, the New York City uh, uh, officials might have argued that point with him <laughs> regarding the New York City pier that he cut up. But in his mind, he was improving it. He was transforming it in from a derelict, abandoned 
building into a park that people could appreciate. He was not destroying property. And although we, no one has said he uh, is since we were brushing against that issue, I just wanted, I know he would uh, be the first to have jumped up and pointed out that distinction in his work. Well, I think that that actually raises a, another point that I wanted to sort of put on the table. And that is that uh, there certainly is a, a heroic presencing in the work. And that heroic presencing, I think, is also uh, cause of envy, it's jealousies, and cause of uh, uh, you know, identifications that a lot of architects would like to have with the work. But in that heroic nature essentially manifests itself to me in this transformative act, this positive destruction, if you will, uh, constructive destruction, in a sense of, of really presencing an other. And the, it's the otherness of the work, which I think is also a source of the power, that there, there was, in fact, because of the scale of it, because of it seeming outside of a kind of normalcy, that the work really gained a lot of power. That, where did this come from? How did this happen? Really, it really created a sense of a sort of extraordinariness in terms of the, uh, the objects themselves. And to me, that, that's really the source of it, that the transformation is uh, really spiritual in that sense, because it does take on the sense of the otherness. And it embodies the otherness in the work. Um, please. Um, to my mind, what the source is doing is that this work is the sort of, um, can you say, disorientation or photograph that one would experience, and also the kind of um, on deck collapse of the built space. And I was struck by the projects that Paul presented um, that there's this interest in creating new buildings, you know, often single family homes, that have some sort of perfume of the ruin or or a kind of danger of dissolution. And I wonder if you would comment on this kind of, what I see as a kind of titillating uh, reference to collapse um, in the buildings that you show. I can disagree with that. Boy, I'm glad I didn't show anything. It's just gonna, who's going to pick that up? <laughs> I've only just gotten this out to the room. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett? <laughs> what was that question? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll try. I mean, I didn't show anything, but I'll, I'll try. I, I think that there is a fascination with the idea of the ruin. And I think the fascination with the idea of the ruin is, in fact, uh, multidimensional. But certainly one of the dimensions is, has, has to do with, and is embodied in, in some way in Gordon Monty Clark's work, has to do with simultaneity of enclosure and exposure. And how do you do that? And the operative metaphor, and architects are always looking for a metaphor, an operative metaphor that's going to structure these divergent op oppositions. And th that what happens is it's the ruin. Right? It simultaneously gives some sense that there was this thing that really suggests a kind of enclosure. And then there's this provisional, ephemeral infill that basically suggests higher degree of, of exposure than the enclosure of the ruin itself. You know, in a way, I think it's hard to discuss Mata Clark's work in terms of in terms of an aesthetic of ruination or of the, of the sublime in that way, except in the in what I think for him would have been kind of the quality of line. The fact that he is slicing through existing building husks means that the the the, the residual, um, not the spaces themselves, but the edges are going to resemble are are, are going to suggest. A state, a state of decay. When in fact, if there's any, if there's anything about most of the buildings that he was working in, um, they were probably more on their way, sort of, they were probably more on their way to ruin, just moving along on their own unused, than they were when Gordon, Gordon decided to interact with them. I mean, he may have been really fascinated with that, with that state, but I don't, I don't think it, um, I, I don't think. I don't think that's where his work was headed. I think when we, when people try to work 
work after you know work after Gordon's work. I think the degree to which um, buildings being buildings, it's I think you're right that in Los Angeles quite a bit of, quite a bit of recent design has to has to do with notions of fragment has to do with notions of fragmentation and overlap. And I think those things do relate pretty quickly to a whole romantic tradition of of, of the ruin. But I don't think that Gordon's work. Um, I think that Gordon's work has any any affinity with that is more more just a consequence of where he was working than what he was. Curious though, you know, I was struck today looking at the films, about how many films there were about tunnels, you know, how many films were about being below ground. I mean, it dawned on me that it would have been as easy, I suppose, to um, be up in, in, in the scaffolds and in, in, in new construction and so forth, but those films weren't there. And so for me, I think one way of trying to understand it as a, is as a pursuit of the other. You know, it, it isn't architecture uh, in a certain way, um, or it's not the architecture that we're taught quite often, which is um, about saturating, I was trying to suggest a sheet of paper with lines and marks, and for me, the, the beauty and the eloquence, um, though I, you know, I agree quite about the complexity uh, of, of the work, is still the simplicity of, 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 of some of the initial ideas or premises. It's, it's quite simply um, you know, tearing or removing. But those aren't simple. <laughs> well, I mean, the physical simple, act may seem simple, simple to you, but it's yeah. enormously, it's normally labor intensive on the one hand, as you pointed out. But on the other hand, it's incredibly difficult because there's a kind of plummeting. You talk about the tunnels, talking about it's a kind of plummeting of a kind of psycho dimension. There's a kind of this, there's a kind of psychic quality to the work that most architecture doesn't even begin to get involved with. And I think that, that again is the source of part of the power of it is that it, there's a dark side here, and nobody talks about the dark side. You know, and certainly in most cases, the architecture doesn't reveal the dark side. It doesn't celebrate the dark side. There's there's a quote to this to this effect in a great people who build tunnels are unto themselves. And I, and I, <laughs> I think it is, I think it is true, but I, I um, first of all, I mean, well, I've, we've been <laughs> running a little long. Right, okay, that's um, the problem. Well, we get seven, right? Um, no, nope. seven before, we actually should get back to. Okay. Just, 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 okay. Yeah. Let me, I'd like to, just, if I could, may I have the privilege of closing? Uh, when I first met Gordon Monta Clark, I met him, uh, as a result of a phone call. And the phone call came from Horace Solomon, who owned with Holly the gallery in Soho at that time, in the late 70s. And uh, I knew Holly and Horace because I was dating an artist that was also represented in their gallery. And Gordon had just been escaped New York as a result of the peer projects, and threatened in jail and lawsuits, and et cetera, et cetera. And so he was, he was coming out here to sort of hide out. And so the phone call was basically to that effect. I had never heard of Gordon Monaco. And uh, certainly, I didn't know who they were, I didn't even know what they were saying. I said, you know, a friend of ours is coming out there and you should see him and we're telling him to give you a phone number and his name is Gordon Monaco. I said, what? Gordon Monaco. Right? <laughs> and I was, I was sort of fascinated by the way in which the words sort of fell out of my mouth as I kept saying it. And, Garden Mata Clark, Garden Mata Clark, and if you if you think for a moment in a way about that, if you actually say that to yourself, would everybody say that to themselves? Garden Mata Clark, come on, we're all friends. Garden Mata Clark. Now look, what happens? Your lips bang together and the tongue flops against the roof of your mouth. Right? There is an isomorphism between that physical, visceral quality of that name and the word. Right. We have we have a sense of wholeness here, a sense of completion. Which also is the same to intrude of Mies van der Rohe, right? That's a measuring name. Gordon <laughs> Mata Clark is a name of great involvement. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>